want to do is uh, present a philosophical meditation in more or less ordinary English. If something is worth saying, it ought to be worth saying simply enough that we can get it, but not too simple. All right. So let's ask the question, does God exist? Well, on second thought, let's not. Let's ask, does anything exist that's worthy of the name God? So let's start with existence. Let's assume what's given. What's given is existence, the world, reality, that things are. About that, <laughs> we don't have to argue. And the question is, is anything there, anything among the things that are worthy of the name of God? One thing we know is there must be something that must be. There must be something that could not not be. Why? Because something is. And if you ask, where did it come from? You can't say nothing. That's a double negative, but I mean it literally. You can't say nothing. You can't say something came from nothing. Because if you could say that, you could say anything. You could prove anything. You could assert anything. It would be anything goes. It would be this, the problem of the deus ex machina multiplied to infinity. You could prove anything, any, you could say something's going to happen, you could say well, on what basis, you say no basis, it's just going to happen. Out of nothing. So if something is, something must be. Now, the usual way, well, there are two ways to go about identifying whatever it is that must be. The first is, let's say, theological. And that is to say, a theory of creation, that God, what is around us comes to be and passes away. And so there must be something which doesn't come to be and passes away, which was always there, which is the cause. And we say that's God. God created the world. You say, oh, okay, well, where did God come from? And the answer is God's a necessary being. You say, well, where did God get his necessity? Say, well, now there isn't any non-circular answer to that. You just say, well, look, that's what I mean by God, the necessary being. God is necessarily, period. No further questions. Well, okay, you notice we just hit a wall. We, we, we got to the point of saying there's something called God who must be the source of all this, but we're stymied in terms of going any farther than that. And so it's starting to look like God, God himself might be a deus ex machina. 
The alternative, which is almost as old as the, the theological answer, in fact, in, 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 maybe it's older, is to say, no, 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 it's not God. It's nature itself. What comes to be and passes away are, are individual physical things. But the but phys, the physis itself, nature itself, that doesn't come to be and pass away. It's absolutely necessary. Well, where did nature get its necessity? Well, that's what we mean by nature. Nature is what always was and always will be. Nature is the, the, the necessity in things. Same wall. So nowadays, if you, you would say, where did everything come from? The answer is the Big Bang. Where did the Big Bang come from? Silence reigns. Except for... <laughs> except for certain cosmic noises there. Silence reigns. Not Deus sive natura. It's either God or nature. Or third possibility. Both. That is, God is nature. Nature is God. And that view is, so the first view is, you would say, theism. Second view is a kind of naturalistic atheism. Third view is called pantheism, but pantheism is a little bit ham-fisted because it's saying every single thing is God. You know, the chair is God, the microphone that doesn't work is God, the bad echoes are, is God, your, your crazy Uncle Harry is God, the, the toilets are God, everything's God. That's a little ham-fisted. So the better, more refined version of that is what's called pan N theism. God in all, all in God. So that God is the underlying, inexhaustible source out of which things come to be and into which they return. God's the underlying ground of things. God's not identical with any particular thing. But God's the source of things from which they emerge into which they return. God isn't separate from those things. God just isn't identical with any one of them. So there wouldn't be any God without the things, and there wouldn't be any things without God. It's not theism, not atheism, not theism, not naturalism. Panentheism. Sometimes called process theology. Right? That actually is beginning to make more sense nowadays. It's made, I think that view is starting to make a bit of a comeback. It used to, it's been around for a while, but in the light of contemporary cosmology, it's starting to get more currency because contemporary cosmology is changing things. We like to think in the ancient world there was no. There was no science in the ancient world. Now we have science, and um, in the ancient world there was no science, but there was a lot of theology. Now we've got science, and we don't need theology. But as a matter of fact, there always was science. It's just that the science was ancient. And so the ancients thought, up there is the gods. That's the region of the gods. We still do that, right? We, when we pray, we look up. Well, if everybody in the, on the globe is looking up, they're all looking in different directions, right? But not in antiquity you were, because that's, that's where God, the God and the gods were. There were three heavens, or maybe seven, depending on which text you're using, and God was in the very highest, and the angels were, and, and demons were in the next highest. Then there was the earth, and then there was the hell below, the, the the lower lands, <laughs> the Nederlands. <laughs> a 
And the idea, life's journey was either up or down. And it was an ancient, one of the ancient uh, Christologies that said when, when Jesus was uh, raised from the dead, one of the things he did was clear the air of the demons so that he would get up there. In getting up there, he'd clear the way for the rest of us to get past the demons to get up there, too, after him. He was the first of the, of the raised, raised ones, and then he cleared the way for the rest of us. God is up, hell is down. There was, a, there, was a, there was a science there, and there was a very, pretty good science of the stars, too. It just was very complicated. So there was a cosmology. What's, what's happened now is that cosmology is obsolete. We need to understand it in order to be able to read these texts. When they say Jesus rose from the dead and was ascended into heaven, you say, what are they talking about? He would be in orbit if he ascended into heaven. He said, well, look, this is the ancient cosmology. So you're thinking about God, but you're thinking about God in terms of, the, of an ancient cosmology. So we got a new cosmology now, where up and down don't make quite the same sense anymore. And looking up to heaven is now looking out at the heavens in the plural. We've not only decentered the earth, we've decentered the sun. We've not only decentered the sun, we've decentered our galaxy, our solar system and our galaxy, and maybe even our universe. It may be that this is, maybe it's the Big Bang heading for entropy. And that's our universe, but that's all, that's only our universe. And there's just one damn universe after another. An endless series of universes. Maybe even multiple universes at the same time. And our little tiny lives occupy no more than 50,000 or so years in a history that so far from the Big Bang is, what is it, 12.8 billion or 13, 8 point billion years, heading for trillions upon trillions upon trillions of years in which the universe is expanding and expanding at an ever more accelerating rate into oblivion. Nothing. So the question that has enthralled philosophers and theologians from antiquity, why is there something rather than nothing is joined by a new question, a counterpart question. Why will there be nothing rather than something at the very end? The new cosmology suggests a new eschatology. What's the end time? The consummation when Jesus will reign and the kingdom of God will be established and Jesus will come down from heaven and God's reign will be established on earth. Well, if so, that will be temporary quarters because the earth has only got about 500,000 to a million years to go before the sun expands and turns it into toast. Or billions, I'm sorry, I got my orders of magnitude right, wrong. 500 million to a billion years before it's toast. So we need to relocate. Well, there's nowhere to run. Where are you going to go? Another uh, galaxy far, far away? 
Same problem. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to run. The material universe is expanding at an increasingly accelerating rate into oblivion. There'll be nothing left but be a, 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 a burnt out, used up energy. Entropy. So the new cosmology is interesting, huh? It, you, you can't do theology in insulation from cosmology. You never could. You never could. The ancients weren't doing theology in, 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 independently of cosmology. They had a very definite cosmological scheme in mind. Turns out to be completely wrong. Utterly, in, utterly false. Their charts about the movement of the stars were, were pretty good. But their account of what was going on was wrongheaded. In a very basic way. So is the distinction between matter and spirit. When you, have, when you start talking about quantum potencies being actualized, being sparked, is that matter or is that spirit? Matter is starting to look like a sort of phenomenological sense of the world, our experience, our, the, the way things look to us. But if you examine it more carefully, it's, it's, what's, what's at the bottom of it is quantum potencies that it get intermittently actualized and do very bizarre things. The distinction between matter and spirit is just not so clear. Ma matter looks awfully immaterial, the, and the immaterial starts to look very material, and intelligence, the spirit, the mind, the soul, looks to be like an extraordinarily delicate, intricate, exquisite neural system. So, what do we know? Not a lot. We know that there is some irreducible necessity in things. We know that there are contingent things that come to be and pass away. And even when we affirm the existence of God, we have to admit, we don't know. God has revealed well, in standard Christian theology, God's revealed God's self to us. But there's, there's this God who hasn't been revealed to us, couldn't possibly reveal himself to us. There's always a deus absconditus, a, a, a God who is concealed to so all the great mystics. This is the mo most fundamental proposition in mysticism. What, what we know most about God is what we don't know. If you understand it, St. Augustine said, it's not God. The highest knowledge is learned ignorance. Not simple ignorance, but ignorant, the knowledge of our ignorance. The knowledge of the unknowability of God. Even the God who has revealed to us himself, Himself is the classical way of putting this because of um, some, some mistaken ideas about biology. Even the God who has revealed God's self to us is unknown to us ultimately. Even when Thomas Aquinas, the great scholastic theologian, proved the existence of God, he said, well, call, let's, instead of calling these proofs, let's call them the five ways the five journeys to God, because God, as God, is concealed. That led Luther to a very scary thought. Luther, you know, was big on revelation, right? We, that's fa fair to say. He thought the scriptures were reliable and that they were the revealed word of God and it was how God spoke to us and he gave the scholastic philosophers a hard time because of all the philosophy. But he said, you know, even the revealed 
scriptures, the revealed God. It's not God when God is really being God. Because when God is really being God, God is hidden. So the, he distinguished the revealed God from the concealed God. And the fellow he was arguing with, Erasmus, said, yeah, well, that may be, but we still, we know, God would never condemn a just man to hell. And Luther says, you, you know that for sure? Can you back that up? You know, all about the, you know enough about the concealed God to know that's true? Why couldn't God in his mysterious transcendence in all of his hidden being condemn a just man to hell predestined from all eternity a, a man or a person who for all the world is just to hell. Now if you want to see Lutheran scholars wrinkle their brow to bring that one up. It's in a book called The Bondage of the Will. And some Lutheran scholars say, look, Luther was having a bad day. He, he ran off the tracks with that one. He just should have never brought that up. And some say, no, no, no. God is the mysterium tremendum. The mystery that scares the daylights out of us. Scares literally the hell out of us, actually. That, th there is, I won't say a short line, but there is a line that goes from that speculation on Luther's part to Nietzsche. Saying, what's going on? It's what he called the will to power. Now, what he, what he meant by the will to power was a little confusing. What he meant was, the expression might mislead you, he meant what's going on is a, is a blind play of forces. Powering here, powering there, emerging here, emerging there, emerging erratically. A play of forces actually looks a little bit like quantum physics, so that things are sort of appearances of these underlying forces, and the forces are just blind forces, and you and I are just playthings of the play of forces. We are certain constellations of those forces that have been brought together in, in this sort of human form, this animal form, and our life is a our life is a constellation of forces seeking to survive and, and not just survive, but to triumph and overcome and in play with other forces, just like the animal kingdom is a play of forces, just like ve the vegetative world is a, is a play of forces where plants fight one another for the sun and moisture, and some plants get strangled by vines and killed off by stronger forces. He says, you love nature, you love the order of nature, you don't know what nature is. Nature is a fierce struggle. That idea got into Nietzsche from Schopenhauer, and it got into Schopenhauer from the German idealists, and it got into the German idealists from Luther. It mutated several times by the time it reached Nietzsche. It, Nietzsche's will to power is not unrelated to the, to the theological idea of the utter concealment of God. What's the utter concealment of God? It's this thing we started with. When you get to God and you say, he's a necessary being, you say, well, how did he get his necessity? Explain that. What do you mean? You can't. But, but you hit the same problem with the Big Bang. And so the physicists will argue 
The dominant theory is the one that I just, just described, but there are plenty of other physicists who don't, who don't buy it. So the Big Bang had to come from somewhere. It came from other universes. So you've got a notion of endless universes, one after the other, one damn universe after the other. What's that sound like? Nietzsche again. <laughs> Nietzsche's notion of eternal recurrence. Universes just keep recurring out of a kind of, uh, out of sheer physical necessity. Bang, bang, bang. The history of the universe is a series of these, we call them, the, the, the metaphor is like it, like it was a big noisy thing, a big bang, but it was actually quite silent. So there weren't any sound waves. It, it was just a point of infinite contraction which expanded explosively in nanoseconds. And that keeps happening one after the other forever. Why? It's necessary. What's going on? Who's to say? So even, even when you, so you've got that root of blind necessity, and you've got another root of theology, but when you take the theology, theological root and you start pressing this question of God as the ends necessarium, the necessary being, you, you get yourself into the same jam. And if you want a pantheistic view and you want to say God is nature, well then, God's headed for oblivion if God is nature. God's headed for entropic dissipation. So uh, it's a problem, right? All right, so here's, here's what I want to do. I, what, what I propose, the way, the way I want to deal with this is say, look, let's, let's think about what we mean by God. Um, let's, let's start all over again. Miranda, where are you? Not here? Okay. Just to, I want to save time for discussion. And <laughs> I just saw what time it is. <laughs> I do this all the time. But let's ask the question again one more time. What do we mean by God? Now, let's now this time try not to think about it in terms of causality. Who made things? How, where did they come from? Let's suppose the idea of God doesn't actually work that way. Or that at, at, at the very least, that that's not all there is to it. What does, what's going on when we use the name of God? My suggestion is, well, it's not my suggestion, but the, the, the suggestion of two people that I like to read and I like, like a lot is that when we use the name of God, we are trying to signify something unconditional. See, we know there's something unconditional in the, in the universe, right? We know all the things around us are conditioned. They come to be and they pass away. There must be something necessary. Well, all the things that exist, everything we ever met, we, we meet. And, and experience under certain conditions. But in the conditions, of concrete conditions of day-to-day -day life, something unconditional is happening. That's the claim. You could deny that claim. And then what really interests you, I would say, from there on in is your stock, stock portfolio. And uh, I can't talk you out of that. I, mean, I, would try to, I would try to make you think that, I would try to make you feel bad about thinking like that, but I can't actually, I don't have a, an argument against thinking like that. So, and so the name of God, then you would just brush it off. And there's no money in it. Unless, well, unless there is, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. There's a lot of money in it. Name of God is the name of something unconditional. What could that mean? Well, the, the, the theologian I like who says that is Tillich. And Tillich is saying, the, by the unconditional, I mean something of unconditional 
value, of unconditional importance, of unconditional um, power, something of, uh, ult a ma he calls it a matter of ultimate concern. So, we've been listening to some beautiful poetry. We've been listening to beautiful music. And people who write poetry and people who devote themselves to music do so because they're crazy. Right? Why? How do you keep body and soul together writing poetry? It's madness. It's very closely related to the name of God, right? Because we will say it's divine madness. The poetry is a divine madness. And we pursue it against our own economic interests. A poet, a painter, a writer, a philosopher, a thinker, a so someone who engages in social action, a, a doctor who joins Doctors Without Borders and goes to West Africa, gives up an, a comfortable practice and puts his life or her life on line to help people afflicted with the Ebola virus. There are people who do, they're crazy people. A, a mania, a divine mania, a divine madness, a divine folly. Because they've invested themselves in something of unconditional value. You say, why are you doing that? Because it is what it is. Why do you want to help people? Why do you want to write poetry? There's, there's no non-circular answer. It is, in the most precise sense of the word, without why. The other thinker I like who uses the expression unconditional is Jacques Derrida, who speaks of something unconditional without sovereignty, unconditional without power, something unconditional meaning that it's got a certain power, but it's without power. And his example is the name justice. He distinguishes justice from the law. He says the law has power. You break the law, you'll be sorry if we catch you. We've got jails. We've got judges. We've got police. The law is very, very powerful. May or may not be just. But justice in itself, if there is such a thing, has no power. You can violate it, and if we don't catch you, you're scot-free. You can ignore it, and nobody will... You can be indifferent to it. What, what does justice do? It, it calls you, it solicits you, it, it, it tries to speak to you, it tries to wake you in the middle of the night. And haunt you with its demand. But you can ignore it. It's unconditional, without power. Tillich, something of ultimate concern, but maybe actually against your own economic interests and, and you know, pr pr everyday practical prudence. Something beyond the ordinary course of experience that interrupts the ordinary course of experience. Something that inserts itself into experience. Something that, that comes over us in a moment and we don't want to hear it. And we close it down. It sneaks up on us. It disturbs us. 
solicits us. It insists. Solicits, calls, disturbs, haunts. It insists. It does not exist. If it existed, it would have power. And in the classical conception of God, you try to bring those two things together. You say God's insistence is God's existence. And if you disobey God, down there. And if you obey God, up there. Well, up there and down there don't make any more sense. And going somewhere where you're going to live forever is starting to make less and less and less sense. And separating your immaterial soul from your material body makes even less sense than it ever did. Doing things because you're going to get rewarded and avoiding them because you're going to get punished is the way you raise children. It's not the way to conduct an adult life. Why do you write, why does the poet poetize? Why does the doctor heal? Why does the scientist search? Why does the social activist seek justice? Why do we desire mercy? Why should we forgive? If you need an answer for that, if you're not going to engage in it, unless there's an answer for that, you need help. If the only reason you're going to be just is that there's something in it for you long term, and the only reason you avoid injustice because, is because you don't want to be punished for all eternity, well then forget it. would rather not have your justice. If you are meek in order to inherit some celestial kingdom where you're going to live forever, you're mythologizing. You're not thinking about what exists. What exists is this world around us. And in this world, there are sparks of light, like mercy and poetry and justice and love and community and respect. And those things are because they are. There's nothing in it for us to engage in them. Yeah? All right. Uh, when, when does the, the discussion period ends when? 135. Okay, I thought it was 135, but it's 130? All right. Now, what was I saying? <laughs> okay. Now, what I mean by radical theology is that there are certain things that meet my description of what I've been calling unconditional, which we want to extricate from any conditionality, that I'll do it on condition that. I'll be just on condition that there's something in it for me. The unconditional is never, never found without concrete conditions, but it is the unconditional thing in concrete conditions. So when you write poetry, you write poetry in a certain language, in a certain time, in a certain place, it's highly, it's highly conditioned. But something unconditional is happening in it, which is what I like to call the event. There is an event taking place under those determinate conditions. 
which is of unconditional import. Now, I think the name of God I think we invoke the name of God as a way to point to that unconditional thing. I think the name of God is the, is the it's one of the best names we have. One of our, our words of, uh, what Heidegger uses the expression, words of elemental power. It's, it's a word of elemental power. That's why it's so damn dangerous, Right? More people have been killed in the name of God than just about any name you can think of, right? But it's also the name which elicits the, the, the greatest uh, acts of courage and mercy, and forgiveness and love. I think the name of God is the, is, is the name that's in our vocabulary to point that out, to point to those phenomena. So you look at Jesus in the New Testament, What's, who is Jesus in the New Testament? Forget about the Nicene Creed for the time being. Let, just drop it. Jesus in the New Testament. Yeshua is the way I like to, call, to say. To, to, I like to speak Yeshua to, to sort of get rid of the baggage of Jesus. You say Jesus, you feel like you're in Alabama. Yeshua. Who is he? He is a storyteller. He's a poet. What's he poetizing? What's he telling a story about? Kingdom of God. He's the poet of the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? It's not complicated. I've come to announce good news for the poor, to feed the hungry, to heal the, the lame, and to announce the year of the Jubilee, the year when all the de our debts are forgiven. When's the kingdom of God coming? In the old cosmology, it was a future off in the distance, and Jesus is going to come down on a cloud, and the graves are going to open up, and God would reign. That's the beautiful story. It's a beautiful mythos. A big story. Lovely story. But to make a long story short, <laughs> it's uh, a story to explain these intermittent acts of mercy that happen here, there, now, then. The kingdom of God is intermittent. It happens intermittently. And it happens intermittently whenever you and I respond to the unconditional solicitation that is taking place whenever the kingdom of God is named. Now, zoom lens, way back out, out as far as you can get, to this a, a point in distant space, looking at a galaxy far, far away. And we zoom in on that galaxy and find a, a solar system. And then zoom in on that solar system and find a little planet. And then zoom in on that little planet and find us, individuals, making the kingdom of God come true. And over the great cosmic expanse, as time goes by, as the universe expands, as, as the dark energy pushes the forces of the universe farther and farther apart, it all disappears without a trace until there is nothing, no things, just fields of used up energy. So then it's meaningless. It's only meaningless if you were in it for something, if you were in it for a return. Its meaning, it seems to me, is intensified by that big story which makes this life a fleeting moment, a precious instance, when there will have been life and love and mercy and forgiveness and God. The name of God is the name that gave this form of life 
its sweetness and also its bitterness and violence. The name of God is what named what was precious in that moment, whose why and wherefore and whence is not only unknown, but doesn't exist. This life is without why, in just the way that love is without why, and poetry is without why, and mercy is without why, and healing is without why. It is its own divinity. This is not something we're doing because of God or for God, or in order to get something back from God, or to avoid God's wrath. This is God. This is making God happen. Intermittently, in a cosmic moment, which for all we know, and as best we can tell, is passing. It's not a long time investment. It is a moment of light. If God is a light, God is a flashing light. It flashes intermittently. And so it's all captured, I think, in that mystical poem that I cite so often. In, uh, from, uh, based, uh, from Angela Silesius. The rose is without why. It blossoms because it blossoms. It doesn't ask if anyone sees it. It cares not for itself. That rose, I think, is what we mean by God. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's have some, some questions. We've got some time. Oké, okay. aan wie mag ik de microfoon het eerst geven? Wie heeft een vraag? Niet allemaal tegelijk. Ik weet dat er wat theologen in de zaal zitten, dus er moeten vragen zijn. Daar gaan we, alstublieft. Ik ben niet een not theologist, dus uh, so ik vraag in normale taal. Maar het lijkt dat de conclusion van je talk, wat ik hoor, is God is a noble impulse that just appears intermittently without reason. But is that God? I mean, that's a nice way to put a, put a, put a brand on it. It's a nice way to put a name on it. But also again, there's no proof. It is just a statement of yours. Uh, yes, yeah, of course there's no proof. Because I start out by saying, Let's talk about that point where we run out of proofs. And let's try to um, map what life is like and what our life means at this limit state where you have no proof. You hit what all the mystics know and what the physicists will be the first to tell you that nowadays is you run up against a point. There's a, one of the, there's a physicist who says, Knowledge is like an island, and the greater the island, the longer the shore of ignorance. So what I'm interested in, what really interests me is exactly what you're objecting to, and that is what really interests me is that point where we run out of proofs, and we start asking, how should we describe ourselves? How can we make ourselves worthy of what's happening to us? What should we do at that point where we can't offer any proofs for what we're doing? You can stick to the proofs, and you can stick to conditions, and you can keep your head down, and you can stay out of trouble, and you can go through life like that. And then I think you'll find that life has at the end of your life, life has passed you by. What, what I mean by radical theology is sticking our neck out, 
the 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 singer who preceded me. What was her name? The the singer who sang b before me. What was her her name? The woman who just said, Tess. Tess says she was going to try to make herself vulnerable and sing something she hadn't rehearsed. And I thought that's a, actually a good image for life. <laughs> what we're doing is performing in a role that we haven't rehearsed. And the really important stuff is the stuff that we haven't rehearsed, that we're not sure about. We don't have any rules for it. We don't have any protocols. And as far as we have protocols, we confine ourselves inside the conditions, and we do what's expected, and we stay inside the, we draw inside the lines. But what makes life interesting is the stuff that we don't have any proofs for. Outside the lines. Now, you could also say, well, you don't, not only do you not have any proofs for it, but why do you want to call that God? Uh, well, I don't. I mean, I'm, it's not my idea. As uh, Catherine Cower at one point says, it doesn't care what you call it. But one of the names for it is God. And what I'm trying to do is give a, a, offer you a, a description, a narrative, a story, an account of one way to read it, hear it. A way that is not caught up in the old mythology and uh, of the old cosmology that still saves its sense and which accommodates itself to the darkest story you can think of in the new cosmology, which is that we're heading for oblivion. I, I don't, see, I don't think philosophers and theologians uh, or poets for the, uh, uh, or artists offer proofs. I don't think they out-argue one another. I think they out-narrate one another. I think some stories are more persuasive, more fetching, more, they grab you. And you recognize yourself in them. It's like when you read a review of a movie you've seen that you, you, you like the movie, but you just can't put your finger on what it is that you like. Or the opposite, you didn't like it. You can't put your finger on what you didn't like. And then the next morning, you read a review in the newspaper, and it just opens it up. You say, ah, that's it. Well, I read philosophers and theologians that way. I'm looking for somebody who, say, who says, who describes things for me in such a way that I say, ah, that's it. That's what's going on. That's what's happening. That's the event. And I recognize my, that's my story. I see it. Now, not everybody has this kind of story because not everybody uses the word name of God. Not everybody uses the name of God as the way we do. A lot of different traditions. There's a lot of places in the world never heard of Jesus, never heard of uh, uh, Christianity or you know, nothing, next to nothing about it. Doesn't matter. I one time, my wife and I one time went to Hawaii and they had built this big, beautiful Marriott Hotel or, or Sheraton or something that we were staying in, right on top of an ancient village, <laughs> ancient Hawaiian village. And they had enough sense anyway to preserve part of it. And, uh, they, and of course, why? Because they could make some money on it. They sold tours for, or, or they included tours in the, in the uh, room, the uh, price of the room. So we took this tour. And a uh, woman gave a lovely uh, tour of, and explained uh, the culture and the religious significance of lava rock, of bowing to the lava rock before you went out fishing because it is dangerous as hell out there to go fishing in a little boat in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, they, they, the world was made of lava rock, right? If you, if you were a native born there 300 years ago. The world is lava rock. The divine substance of things is lava rock. Lava rock is the beginning and the middle and the end. It is the inexhaustible source from which we come and to which we return, which we revere. It is all in all. This is beautiful, profound theology of lava rock. I never heard of Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So 
what, what's happening in religion is, is a, what in philosophy we call a phenomenological event. It's not the name of God. It's not the name of some being out there who made everything. It's the name of, it's a name we've, that has gotten itself forged and formed in the course of our history to point out certain deep structures in our existence. And we've got other names like that, like mercy and love and forgiveness, etc. Yes? Come on. Jack, with your elaborate answers, this is probably the final question. Oh. We never get to the final question. <laughs> I had the impression that you took uh, God out of causality and put him into art. Um, maybe I had the wrong impression, but is it not very important that we uh, keep the possibility open that science, the world of causality, still is a world also connected to locals? For example, uh, heading that the universe is heading to oblivion. We don't know. We don't know what uh, the connection of matter and spirit that happens nowadays, which was impossible to think of 500 years ago, what it will bring us. I mean, we are actually uh, having control over the earth, also in a destructive way, but why is it not possible to have, at the end, also control over the universe with the, the evolution of the spirit going on now? Yeah, possible. I don't think it's very likely. I think it's possible. You, if you wanted to, I think the best way, if you want to keep God linked up to causality, then I think the best way to do it is with the panentheistic model that God would be the inexhaustible power of the universe itself, which would then mean, then you'd be pegging your, putting all your marbles in the, into the bag of endless universes. And that's, uh, the, the, the notion of the universal entropy is not, uh, when you say we don't know, that right, that's, that's how I started, we don't know. But it is a dominant theory. And, there are other theories, and if they prove to be right, there's going to be some Nobel Prizes uh, being issued shortly to a, a guy named Paul Steinhardt, who has uh, wrote a book called Endless Universes. Um, that might prove to be true, and tomorrow morning, some PhD, unemployed PhD in physics who's working in a patent office is, li pub is liable to publish the first of four articles that change the history of physics and the course of physics. That's the nature of the, the beast. Yeah, we don't know. Um, but we've got, um, we've, some, some, some interpretations are better than other interpretations, some are more plausible than others. Um, my, my own, what I proffer to you is, is an alternate account in which it, it, the name of God isn't functioning in, in terms of physical, cosmological causality. It's functioning, it's functioning uh, phenomenologically. I wouldn't say I put it in art. I don't put it in. I don't confine it to art no more than I would confine it to religion. I want to uh, I want to. I want to help break the name of God out of pr the prison of religion in the narrow sense, and say that it's not found just in religion. It's also found in art, but it's also found in science, and it's also found in social action, and it's also found in. Um, ordinary life. It's found in, in community exchange. It's found everywhere because it's, it's not a local event, it's a depth event. It's not localized in religion and then I didn't just try to relocalize it in art. I'm trying to say it's not a locality or a region, it's a depth dimension in everything. But it's a phenomenological depth dimension. That is to say it's our experience of the cosmos. The cosmos itself doesn't know we're here, as far as we can tell. We are the way in which the cosmos knows it's here, because we are stardust. So this is a kind of stardust theology. Remember, mortals, you are stardust, and unto stardust you shall return. 
But I, so I think name of God functions not artistically but phenomenologically as a, as a name for a structure, a deep structure in our experience, in, in whatever form our experience occurs, wherever, whenever, in, in every. There is no temple in the heavenly Jerusalem. God is everywhere. Miranda, may I take one more question? There's probably no way to stop you, Jack. Um, <laughs> well, I don't want to screw your schedule up. I can take them separately you, afterwards, or I don't want to screw your schedule up. Do, can you do one briefly? I should ask that, Kathy. I don't know <laughs> your wife is somewhere in the audience. That's what Derrida no. calls the impossible. Yeah, somebody told me yesterday, oh, Derrida was worse than Jack, so don't, don't be too hard on him. He was. Three okay. hours he would go. Three hours. Um, well, schedule-wise, actually, we have to call it and stop it right now. Right, well, no, I'm that's not true. We've got four minutes. Four minutes. Who's got a quick question? You're closest by. But Jack's not leaving, so he'll do your question yeah, personally, that's right, the other Jack? Thing. I'll be, do you get the personal treatment? I'll stick around. Why do you call this structure or this event or this unconditional God? Why do you need this name? I don't. And yes. I, it's not my idea to call it God. Uh, it's what we've been calling God for a long time. And so what I'm trying to do is say, when that's what I said at the beginning. Remember I said, what's going on when we use the name of God? Okay, I'm not trying to tell you that when you leave here, you better start using the name of God um, and use it this way. I'm saying, what are we doing when we say God? What's going on? Well, there's a sort of mythological uh, answer to that, and it was once a very mythological idea, but we, we sort of gotten past that. Uh, we haven't gotten by past mythos in the sense of story, but we have gotten past the old, myth, old, the old mythological cosmology. And the name's with us, and it's being used, and it has, uh, I think it has power and import. And, and so what I'm trying to do is offer you a description of what's going on when that word happens that isn't caught up in the mythology of a super being who created everything out of nothing and, and lives up in the sky. So it's not my idea to use this name. I didn't... I didn't make it up. I brought it up, but I didn't make it up. And I don't care what you call it. If you're, if you're with me on what I'm saying about something of unconditional importance, then yeah, I don't care what you call that. <coughs> and it doesn't either. That's, that's on, and on that bombshell. Ladies and gentlemen, mag ik u a hartelijk applaus for... Professor John D. Caputo, Jack for Friends. Thank you, Jack, so much. <laughs>